thank you all for being here and, and having this opportunity to talk about um, the plant side of this whole thing. Um, and from the off, I don't want this, I, I, I'm determined that this no, will not be sort of the, the plant person in the corner moaning about how it's all over there. Because we do that between ourselves all the time anyway, so, so I get that out of my system when surrounded by plant biology. <coughs> Um, what I want to do here is to look at some ideas that have been around in um, the plant science. It, it, a lot of this comes from science education, actually, and research in that area. Um, also, where I'm coming from with this is that um, I'm based within a plant science department, um, and it ties in with a bit of the stuff that we were saying yesterday about um, paleontologists being the ones who know about whole organisms and how they work in an increasingly um, molecular biology-driven world of research. Um, exactly the same thing. I'm, I'm there's about 30 people in the plant and crop group at Nottingham, so it's the biggest group of, of plant scientists in the UK in terms of research, and I'm the only one who will use the B word, botany. No one else will use the B word. Um, I'm so th th the wider context for this is that, um, yeah, like I said, I don't want to do that whole feeling sorry for myself thing. So I've got it out of my system now. There we go. Right. So plant blindness is a very timely thing. It's everywhere in the literature about um, plant science education, about science education at the moment. Um, the whole idea was, so there's been ideas about um, zoo chauvinism and zoo centricism in the literature before it crystallised into this notion of, of plant blindness. Um, it's the inability to see or notice the plants in our environment, um, the inability to recognise their importance um, in this particular definition in the biosphere and in human affairs. So it's, it's already sort of from the point of view of what, what's about the humans. Um, the inability to appreciate the aesthetic and unique biological features of the life forms um, within the plant kingdom and the misguided anthropocentric ranking of plants as inferior to animals and this as unworthy of consideration. So, and as I say, James um, Wandersey and Elizabeth Schuster, um, American um, plant science educators. So this is coming from sort of that end of the spectrum. Um, this has, as I say, mushroomed recently. It's very timely. Um, this is the poster. So, so, so they came up with this idea. It was part of a whole sort of piece of action that they wanted to do around this. They distributed the poster, Prevent Plant Blindness, with the little red glasses. You know, if you put on red glasses, you can't see the green. <laughs> Sent out to 20,000 schools in the US. And, and yeah, so it was a, a call to action, really, crystallizing this notion of, of plant blindness. OK, so what are the symptoms of plant blindness? Just some, some, so I do a lot of working with schools, and I do a lot of talking to different groups of people. I also teach undergraduates. Um, Last week when I was talking to some five and six year olds and I start off, we, we talk about what's a fossil and what's not a fossil and I have a tray of objects and I sort of, these are some of the things that I hand out to them and they, we say, has it ever been a living thing? And if I do it with shells or if I do it with, a, a, you know, this is a dinosaur boat, they, they, is, has it been a living thing? Yes. Give them either of these things. Has it been a living thing? No. <laughs> so at that age they haven't, you know, plants aren't living because they don't do all the things that they consider living things to do. They don't run, they don't bite, they don't eat, they don't poo, they don't do any of the things that li living things in their notion fit. They can identify some of them, so if I give them that object, they'll say, yeah, that's a conker, and they know about conkers. If I say, do you know what sort of leaf that is? And they go, mm -hmm. So five and six-year-olds in this country don't know what an oak leaf is. This is kids not from a, a, a they're not based in the city. This is a semi-rural area, and they didn't know what an oak leaf was. I teach second-year environmental scientists, and we realised there was this gulf in what they knew about plants, so we stuck in a new module that, that, that did some basic plant ID. <laughs> I showed them a conker, and they knew that was a conker, and I showed them oak leaves, and they didn't know what tree they were from. <laughs> Same pattern. Um, not all of them. Some of the environmental scientists were very knowledgeable. Most of them have that same lack in their knowledge. And it's not, it's not a sort of, oh, I, I, I hate that stuff, I don't want to learn it. It's just never entered their sort of consciousness. It's quite frightening. And I think the people in this room probably 
because if you're interested in natural history in any sense, you are already tuned, you know, we're not the plant blind here. But, but for most people, even people studying what you consider to be a degree in a subject where they should have this wider notion of the plants in their environment, a lot of them don't, is my point. Okay, so plant blindness, you can... I haven't even got to anything about fossils yet. Um, <laughs> plant blindness, there have been lots of studies and they can be as shallow as um, how many names of things do you know that are plants and how many names do you know animals and guess what, everybody knows lots of animals. Um, it can be uh, things like likes and dislikes. It's even, there's been studies that have been looking at um, the visual systems and actually we're evolutionarily wired to notice living things that are moving. We're, we're, we're wired to notice animals and not plants. So there is some research on that side as well. And of course, this all has implications. Um, it's part of this wider sense of we're disconnected from nature increasingly. Um, lots of people working on that. Um, there was a recent public engagement review that came out from the Natural History Museum all about that whole notion of what the effects of that might be. Um, and it has implications for our health and well-being, um, research on that front as well but also that idea of conservation priorities. Everybody knows, we, we talked about pandas yesterday. Um, nobody talks about cycads, you know, critically endangered, um, but they're not fluffy and they haven't got a cute face. Um, so if people aren't botanically literate and if they don't even notice the plants around them, how are they gonna care about, you know, species in danger? Right. So. Is plant blindness at play in paleontology? Um, you bet your bum it is. <laughs> um, is it relevant to how we communicate in life through deep time? I would argue, yes, strongly. It's, it's really important. If we're going to represent the natural world through deep time, <laughs> plants have got to be part of that story. Um, do the reconstructions, which are crystallizations of our understanding of a best set environment at a set time, um, do they represent a plant blind worldview? Or is there a mix of stuff in there? <laughs> Why should we care? Because that's, you know, the way the, uh, we can discuss this to the nth degree, but does it matter? And if we decide that we do care and that plant science is <coughs> embedded in some of the stuff that we do, how can we ameliorate the effects of that? Can we do anything about it? Okay, well, we can take that definition and we can say, can we apply it to the fossil record? Um, and with a couple of quick edits, yeah, yeah, we can apply this to, to, to looking at um, paleontology and reconstruction. So we just take out the, the plants in one's environment, plants in an environment. Um, we can screw about the humans. Let's take them out of the, the whole thing here. And in that final little bit, the misguided anthropocentric ranking of plants as inferior to animals. Uh, so my, my background is Mesozoic paleobotany. So, 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 so I'm used to dinosaurs in the foreground, plants in the background. Um, and so quite often, it's, it's not anthropocentrism that we're worrying about. It's all that stuff we were saying yesterday again about, you know, the big, the stars of the show. So, yeah, we can, I think we can apply this idea of plant blindness and stick it into how we're framing life in the past. Okay. Where is this plant blindness within how paleontology works? Um, it, it it's not just at the end point, it's, it, it's, it's embedded all the way through. It's, it's in the, the way that fossils are collected. Um, it's in the way that, that what gets researched on, because there's choices in that too. Um, how that gets disseminated, how people, you know, what gets published, what doesn't. And then all the way and it trickles down into popular culture. And, and it's a leaky pipeline, if you like, at all points. So the people who are collecting, if you've got a new site and you've got state, great stuff, Quite often, you know, anecdotally, again, you know, yeah, we got this great, these bones out, and oh, there was, yeah, there was some black stuff in there, it's probably plants, but, but yeah, we, we, we chucked that. Um, we weren't interested in that. Likewise, there aren't many paleobotanists. There are paleobotanists, but they're, they're in the same way that botany, the B word, is, is a field that is in decline, um, paleobotany, the same pattern can be observed. Um, <coughs> And that all filters down. So you've already got this, this dwindling pool of stuff coming through. Um, and without it being, you know, without cheerleaders in there, 
steps of make sure that it gets represented. Um, it's there in the system and it's reinforcing as well because if you don't see plants being represented at the, sort of the popular level, then the next generation of people who are coming into the research process, you know, it's, if you're not represented, you're not in the game. Right, so let's look at some examples. I picked this one partly because it's one of my favourite books in the whole world, um, but also because I didn't want to offend anyone. I thought this was kind of neutral territory, but this shows the sort of thing that I, you know, archetypal plant blindness. So it's, 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 there are plants there, yeah, but but but, but um, it's all a bit wishy washy. Look at this bit. This just washed out, kind of, you know. So this is English Wielding. So this is. Um, 25 million years ago. Um, what upsets me is not so much the wishy-washy planty bit. It's more, it's this. <laughs> you know, herbivores standing on bare soil. If you go out into, you know, the real world, how long does a bare soil actually sit there without some plants colonising it? How, and, and if you're somewhere that sustains big herds of huge, you know, herbivores, you know, they need all that biomass. And, and yes, this is 40 whatever years ago. This is not how we do it now. This is, this is sort of, but this is the idea that everybody sort of has in their head of what the Mesozoic looks like. And it's, it's almost theatrical. It's the idea that you've got the backdrop. The plants are, you know, the, the scenery, really are the scenery in the background. And then you've got the actors who are, you know, the tetrapods at the front. And that's common to a lot of stuff. As I say, this is not, this is deliberately sort of, this is what the late 20th century conception of how plants should be represented is. So you've got them there. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's a bit vague. And they are backdrop. Okay, so we had this slide up already yesterday. Juria Antiquio. Henry Della Beach, um, 1830. So, are there any plants in this picture? Who thinks there are any plants in this picture? Do you reckon, Gary? Yeah. Okay, yes, there are plants. And actually, you've got these lovely palm trees off in the background. So, so from the very first reconstruction, there were plants in there. They're there. Um, uh, the, the sort of tropical palms, so this is from, again, it's, it's, it's all this Mesozoic stuff. They, they just worked out that there was something that was like cycads, made them of cycads. Maybe there were benetites. But, but um, people were noting that there were plants there and aiming to represent them. Notice that these are a bit <laughs> even sort of more sort of nondescript than the things we were looking at in the later book. Um, if you then go to the lithograph that was the thing that was sold to make money for Mary Anning that was, was based on that, you can already see that that's improved a bit. They actually look like plants in this one rather than just twigs stuck in an <laughs> island. Um, so at this point, actually, people are thinking about the plants and about representing them. Even though this is you know, it's dominated by a, a marine scene, they've actually thought, we've got plants, we should be representing them. And not that long after that, actually, so if you you know, just moving steadily through the 19th century in Goldfuss's fossils of Germany. Look at this. This is, plants are forefront and centre. This is a piece of, you know, this has been done with love. Look at this sort of Geiger-esque forest <laughs> um, of lycophytes. Um, you've got a few, you've got a few animals. I'll let you have them. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> a few invertebrates at the front. Um, but this is, this is celebrating the plants that are there. And, and, and just that, you know, it's, it's a thing of beauty. Um, so at that point, and of course the context is that, that coal has made a lot of people a fortune. Coal is driving progress. We talked about progress yesterday. Um, so maybe back in the middle of the 19th century, actually, that's a factor in why people did appreciate the plants and did want to represent the plants. And actually... A reconstruction about a particular snapshot of time that was celebrating those plants and didn't, you know, it's unrepentant. You don't need a big animal in the middle. 
to have a paleo reconstruction. That's what I love about this. And I think Martin Rudwick got mentioned yesterday, but, but, but I mean, th this is all discussed in, in detail in his, his, his earlier book, Scenes from Deep Time, which yeah, covers this whole idea of how we represent them. Okay. Other representations from a similar time, so coming through to 1862. <laughs> Biddulph Grange has this wonderful geological gallery. Um, James Bateman, again, a man whose family made their money from coal, Okay, thought that um, the public should know about the history of life on the planet. And it was done in, so he, was, he was, it didn't agree with Darwin's ideas. So this was his way of representing that the fossils were showing us that the pattern of creation was there. So if you walk down this corridor, you've got day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. <laughs> day three, and then, yeah, it's still being lovingly restored. Um, so day three is still being worked on, but it's, again, it's an unrepentant celebration of, of coal measures, plant fossils, again. So when coal was important, did that make plants more important? I don't know. Should it? It's really interesting. Okay. Right, so, so that was 19th century. Late 20th century, we've already said that we, we get representations um, that are theatrical. You have the player at the front, you have the backdrop, which might have some things that more or less resemble um, Araucaria trees and tree ferns. Okay. Post Jurassic Park, the only thing I'm going to say, because you have to mention Jurassic Park in these talks, is that it had a paleobotanist in it. <laughs> the one and only fictional paleobotanist. Um, I'm not going to say anything more than that, just yay. And it was Laura Dern. Cool. Um, and also the realism that entered into how we represent these things meant that actually people did, to a certain extent, have to up their game with the plants. You know, filming in, in New Caledonia to get the Araucaria forests and things for, for walking with dinosaurs. So with that realism and going from that staged kind of, hello, I'm a theropod in the foreground, to actually trying to represent things in a more realistic, natural history film kind of way, meant that they actually did have to go away and find the right plants. And, and get rid of the grass. Okay. So, um, like other forms of unconscious bias, you know, we've got to admit that there's a problem and then we can deal with it. Um, how to make plants more visible. So, having spent a lot of time trying to persuade people to think that plants in the fossil record are actually interesting, just quickly, ways we can do that. Um, the fact that you've got amazing co-evolutionary relationships in the fossil record. So I'm, I'm not saying it's all about the plants, I'm saying that everything is interrelated. We've said this, you know, you've got whole ecosystems. That is not a butterfly, that is a lacewing. That's a calamigratid lacewing. That is not a flower, that is a benetite. So before there were butterflies and flowers, there were other insects and plants doing exactly the same thing. The stories like that, that can help make people think about plants in the fossil record in a new way. I know people really have a problem with the idea of living fossils. Mm -hmm. However, however, I'll push back a little bit. For plants, actually, I, I, I actually do feel that something like a metasequoia or a ginkgo, they have been doing more or less the same thing. They really have since, you know, for most of the Mesozoic. And actually, um, I have less of a problem with the idea of talking about living fossils if that gets people interested and actually, um, yeah. And, and all the other, you know, plants that have been around for just as long, much longer. Um, they're still around us, and that's a hook as well. That's a way of, sort of talking about it. You are going to see moss wherever you are. And actually, moss has been on the planet, you know, 400 odd million years. It's a way of, of getting people to think about it. <laughs> Cellular snapshots. So these are examples of plant fossils where you have exquisite detail. I, I told someone I was going to talk about plant sex. Um, that's sperm release in an early land plant captured in the Rhiney Church, yeah, which is utterly amazing, you know, and, and then people go, what, plant sperm? And there's, there's a whole thing to unpack there. So we have extraordinary fossils. This is chromosomes preserved in a Jurassic royal fern. So we've got cellular, we've got cell biology here. Um, this is work that Sandy Hetherington did looking at stem cells, so the, the, the root meristem 
and demonstrated that this was an active dividing merry stem when this plant got preserved. So we've got things at that scale that are really interesting. They don't help us with the landscape thing, but they are things that we can hopefully get a message across with because they're cool. I think the most compelling argument, though, is that plants are, can be viewed as, as sensors, environmental sensors. They tell us about what was going on in terms of climate at the time. If you take, so this Jurassic slab of ginkgo leaves, if you get the cuticle off, if you look at the details of the plant cuticle, you can see, so this is actually from a Cretaceous ginkgo, but you can see the stomata, the air pores in that leaf. If you can look at the density of those stoma and you can plug them into models which um, generates um, CO2 calculations through time. So you can look at modelling climate change through time using plants. And again, that's a strong angle. It doesn't help with, again, filling the landscape, but in terms of why should we care about the plants, that's another strong angle. So, as I said, I didn't want to moan. What I wanted to do was to sort of give an overview of where plants sit within how we represent paleo environments, um, some ideas about how we can up their, a bit of PR, how we can up their image. Um, and also it's about striking a balance. I don't think, you know, plants are never going to be, apart from in that beautiful carboniferous reconstruction, mm -hmm. Plants are never going to be at the forefront. That's okay, actually, but I just want them to be you know, fairly represented. You know, th th we wouldn't be here without the plants. In any environment, the plants are actually the base of that food chain. Um, so just, yeah, we can think about how we can better represent them. Thank you for listening. Right.